My name is Grace Larichelle, and I am on the CATS team, it's the Children's and Teen Services team here at B&T, as the Eastern Rep for all things children's and teen. Before I came to Baker and Taylor a few years ago, I worked in public libraries myself, um, primarily in children's departments, running children's departments, and then as a branch manager in the Northeast. So today we're talking about all things decodable and phonics. And what are decodables? That's what I want to dive into. We have several ways that we're using phonics and decodables in learning to in the learning to read sphere today. Um, reading instruction that utilizes phonics teaches the relationships between written letters and words and the actual sounds of those words. And this technique teaches children based on the alphabetic principle, which is the idea that letters represent the sounds of spoken language. And then the next step is decoding. And that's when a reader can recognize the letter sound relationship in the written word and then translate that word into speech. This method teaches pre-readers and early readers that all words are all organized and that there are logical and predictable relationships of letters and the words that we read and then the words that we speak as well. These two steps are relied on heavily in the science of reading approach in teaching instruction. Opposed to what's been used for many years called balanced literacy, which employs relying on context illustrations and stories and so there's a bit of a shift over the past few years to the science of reading, utilizing those phonics and decodables. This is happening all over the country, most notably that I've heard in my conversations with librarians in Ohio specifically, uh, but there are other states that are also moving to the science of reading. During the first half of 2023, so many school systems across the country have moved away from the balanced literacy and into using phonics and decodables more heavily with their emerging readers. Um, we have a lot of phonics books that, kind, that tend to be very helpful. We have the Bob books. We have them here. You might remember them if you don't have these in your collection already as those whimsy books that you had to find a case for. Um, and we're always a pain to check in at circulation and were in, very easy to lose. But these have many books in one and they come in this sturdy binding so that you have the whole set, like this one is sight words, but we have many of them um, in sets like this. So you can further bolster your community's need for early reading. Um, we also have other phonics titles with uh, favorite characters. So we have Monster Trucks, we have Biscuit, we have Fancy Nancy, we have Paw Patrol. So that's also a helpful tool in getting your, your community the books that they need that are going to help bolster that phonics learning. We also have an entire selection list because we've heard so much from our customers about this need for decodable books. So we've made a selection list that you can find under uh, on our website on Title Source 360 under Browse, and then you click on Selection Lists, Children's and Teen, and you'll see it under the heading of Baker and Taylor Prebinds under Paw Prints. And so you'll see a list there called New List Phonics and Decodables. Sarah and I, Sarah is my Western uh, half of the, of the country um, Children's and Teen Specialist, just as I am for the Eastern. She and I both have a background in libraries, and so we are always here to help if you have any questions on anything science of reading, anything phonics, anything decodables. We're happy to send you samples and help you find what you need. To learn more, or if you'd like to read a white paper that we have on phonics and decodables, just let us know. We would be happy to send it to you. And I look forward to talking with you more about decodables soon. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another Cats Coffee Break. I'm Sarah Shepard, your Western Cats Manager, and we have a bunch of folks here today to talk about decodable books, which is a hot topic right now in library land and in education. A lot of really great material um, for you guys to learn about today. Hello, um, my name is Katie Buckley. I'm an editor with Cherry Blossom Press. Um, before I became an editor, I was actually a teacher in the classroom for 10 years. So um, I'm bringing that to our team. Right, next, uh, we have Cecilia Minden, who is an author. Hi, Cecilia. Uh, I am a former director of the reading program at Harvard Graduate School of Education. And when I retired, I uh, 
started writing children's books and have been writing children's books with Cherry Lake for quite a long time, having a great time with it. So I'm looking forward to talking to you all about it. All right, great. Um, next, we have another author. We have Elizabeth Scully. Hey, Elizabeth. Hi. I, too, am an author here, and I am also a reading specialist at Niagara Weefield Central School District up in New York State. This is my 20th year of teaching. <laughs> Seems to have gone quite quickly, and I generally work with mainly kids from pre-K through sixth grade, but I've had quite a bit of experience also up into the high school level, too. Awesome. All right. And then we have Amanda Gebhard, who's an editor or the editor of the In Bloom series. Hey, Amanda. Hi, how are you guys doing today? Um, I'm so happy to be here. Um, my name is Amanda Gebhardt, uh, and I've been working in educational publishing since 2006. Uh, from there, I started working in phonics, in decodables, in struggling reader work, English language learner curriculum, worked in social studies, and for a lot of the major school publishers that are out there building curriculum from uh, usually focusing on grades K through five, uh, especially the early reader grades, but also all the way up through high school. Same with Liz. We uh, have spanned other sides of the coin throughout our careers. Awesome. And Katie, you want to talk about a little bit about Cherry Blossom Press? Sure. So just a brief overview of our Cherry Blossom Press imprint. Uh, we created this imprint with students and educators in mind, and we aim for student choice in phonics instruction and pride ourselves on having a large selection of early readers to choose from. With our decodable offerings, we've created a sequence that helps students move from learning to read to reading to learn. Awesome. Love that. Um, all right. Um, next, we're just going to have our authors read uh, from their decodable books. So we're going to start with Cecilia. And Cecilia is the author of What Can Bella See? Chapter two. Bella likes to sit on the step. Bella can see so much. Bella can see Bob. Bella can see Bob toss the ball to Dan. Bella can see Jill. Bella can see Jill and Anne Hop. We're going to have Elizabeth, and she's going to read uh, one of the books that kind of features more of the human point of view, I guess I would mm -hmm. say. Um, and she's the author of A Fish for Cam. So go ahead, Elizabeth. A Fish for Cam. Cam is with his pal. Cam is in this pet shop. Cam will get a pet. What pet? will Cam get? Cam can get this cat. Cam can get this bird. Cam can see a red flash in that tank. All right, so let's just have a little bit of a conversation with our editors and our authors. Um, so our first question that we're gonna talk about is how did you select your characters? Let's start with Elizabeth. Uh, well, in a house full of boys, there's a lot of animals that come through our house, some by chance, some by choice, some that I discover. Uh, we have a pond right beside us, and so I constantly am having fish come home, some of which that do not belong inside a house, nor in a fishbowl. But it definitely is the idea that, you know, you can also get fish other places, boys. They don't have to all come from the pond. And that's where the story generally came from. A lot of my stories come from the animals that are around our house or that are influencing our household. Awesome. And Cecilia, how did you just select your, you know, doing a cat as your kind of your main character? Well, it's a short vowel word. It's easy to say, easily decodable. And the constant repetition is needed for this particular book because I was asked to write a book that was for children who missed time during the pandemic and they got behind in reading. And so I knew from my own experience that the first thing that kids want when they get the upper grades, that's grade one and grade two, they want chapter books. It has to be a chapter book. So I devised this particular things so that we would have chapter one and chapter two. But the thing that sets it apart is that there's a lot of repetition and a cat is just such a sweet character. Absolutely. And a cat is not predictable at all. You never know what they're gonna do. 
And so it gives you a lot of feedback when you're reading the book with the child. Because if you're saying, what can cats see? Well, what do you think they can see? And do you want to help me figure out what they can see? And she's a really sweet cat and she loves to move around, but you're not going to tell her what to do. She's going to do what she wants to do. But I, I just really liked the idea for looking out in the neighborhood. And, you know, sometimes cats sits in windows and you don't know what they're looking at. You, you know, you wonder what's going through their mind, what they might see. But I just thought the story was one that lent itself to a real interaction with the kid while you're reading it. One of the things that I think um, makes this series and I mean, everything that Cecilia has done for so long for Cherry Lake, which is, or for Cherry Blossom, um, which is really telling these stories and you have this a more natural language. One of the things I think turns people off of phonics learning and phonics application is that it feels so devoid of joy from the reading, right? Separated from this joy of reading, of finding these books, of finding these stories. And I think what they managed to do is to give us these stories. They are narrative based, they have characters um, and they really come to life and, and they have this, it's a short little story. They, they aren't hundreds of pages, but they are at a manageable level. So students can not only decode the words and apply these skills, but they are having a reading experience and it's an independent reading experience. It's mm -hmm. something that they can do on their own. It's something that they can apply their skills. It's something that they can do with a parent or with a teacher um, or with a librarian and, and really get to see what that a successful story that I've reached the end, I've reached the last page, I've completed it. Um, it's really, there's no other feeling um, like that in the world. Can you talk about um, how you take a common lived experience like getting a pet uh, and set up the framework for the book using a decodable format? You are limited, as Liz said, very, very limited uh, on the words that you have to work with. And you have to go with words that are decodable and then you have sight words, which are words that they learn to read. And some of those sight words end up being uh, content words and you try to keep that as little as possible. And I just, I've been working with kids for 30 plus years, 40 years, 50 years, and I just have been around them. And I, I know kids like funny, kids really like funny. And when you put funny in a book, it's, it's just gonna be more what they want. And if they win the game, that's great. If they're the ones that are on the stage, you know, put them center stage, make them the most special part of the book. And I, I love writing these books. I'll keep writing these books as long as I can. But I, I want the child to see him or herself in the book. And that's what, that's what we try to do. You know, there's always, when we're writing books, we're thinking about, there's always some type of problem that comes through. Whether it's small, an overt problem, more of a hidden problem. Sometimes those hidden problems come out in the form of the illustrator's help. But then we realize there's overcoming with it and kids get to work through that process and see how that story develops because later on that replicates itself with books that they'll someday grow into further. And that still captures them at this, at this point too. But that also makes it tricky when trying to develop the story with also keeping within the constraints of the words. So we're always trying to play around with both of those pieces because you read to know what happens next and it makes you want to, figure out how is it going to be pushed through those pages with a choice of those words. And it's always a little bit of tinkering. I guess I find like the first time I write it, I'm going back to have to change things around to tinker it with both the word choice, the way the words are going to be like the, making sure that they're decodable words. But then does the story have a problem enough that I want to read it more or know what's going to happen or how they're going to resolve it? And of course, as Cecilia mentioned, they want to laugh but they also like a little bit of trouble. Like kids want to see things just to have a little bit of trouble versus like maybe it's an animal that creates a bit of problem with dirt or rolls something and hides it away. We all enjoy that part. And it brings us all a little bit of laughter and joy. And I think too, that this idea that we're trying to bridge this learning to read to reading to learn, and we're, we're working really hard on making learning to read fun and joyful and really 
introducing the earliest kind of books and the earliest skill application to something that's fun. But we also know and realize that as soon as they learn to read, they're going to be asked to read to learn. And there's a lot of background knowledge that needs to be built um, or, or, or access that they have, that they're coming in knowing these things and having the things that they know be able to translate into words now that they recognize is so important. So I think the sight words that have been chosen that Cecilia and uh, Elizabeth choose for us are really those necessary words the words that they're going to use when they're talking, the things that they like, things that are good. They might be more advanced sound spelling skills, but introducing them early enough, even words like baseball or football or soccer, these are things that they know. You see them as a word on a page and they can connect their ideas of the world, their knowledge to what they're reading. And it really gets that kind of core reading comprehension skill kickstarted in a really important and valuable way. Uh, so that's something that I think these books also do is that even those things that are not decodable are always building towards that deeper knowledge and that more authentic reading experience. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap this up then. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you to our authors and our editors. And thank you to our viewers out there. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.